Welcome to the Sports Spectrum Podcast, where faith and sports collide. Here's your host, Jason Romano. And welcome everyone to the Sports Spectrum Podcast. My name is Jason Romano. This is episode number 11, and we are so grateful and thankful to have you joining us here. Uh, My prayer is that you become encouraged. My prayer is that you become educated. My prayer is that you become entertained in the Lord in listening to the stories of these different people intersecting the world of sports and of faith. As always, you can leave a review on iTunes. Just search Sports Spectrum and you can write your review. And we've had so many wonderful uh, messages and reviews left from people. So we are thankful for that. And as always, sportspectrum.com is our home. You can check that out. Lots of great articles there. Daily content, including a daily devotional every morning at 6 a.m. that's published. So definitely check that out as well. Today's guest is David Nelson, and he joins us on the podcast. He is a former NFL wide receiver. He won two national championships as a member of the Florida Gators. You might have heard of his quarterback, a guy named Tim Tebow. He played with the Bills and the Browns and the Jets from 2010 to 2014. And he and his brother Patrick have started a nonprofit organization called I Am Me, the letter I, the letter M, and then the word me, that focuses on ending the orphan cycle in Haiti. David is awesome. He's doing a great work for the Lord, and he was inspired by a trip to that country in Haiti in 2012, and we talk about that coming up. But David's just a really encouraging guy with a great story, and he also talks about some of the struggles that he's going through in his post-NFL career about wanting to still play in the National Football League. We hope you enjoy this podcast episode number 11 with David Nelson. David, welcome to the Sports Spectrum Podcast. How you doing? Man, I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing well, man. It's so good to have you here, and I love your story. I've been following you for a while now, obviously working at ESPN for many years. I know uh, from on the field all your successes, but I want to go back and, and talk a lot about where it all started for you. Wichita Falls, Texas? What was life like for you as a young boy growing up deep in the heart of Petrolia High School? Yeah, you know, it was... Uh... Gosh, there's nothing like uh, Texas high school football. But even before then, I mean, just believe it or not, I actually didn't start playing football until uh, probably eighth grade. Um, just growing up my entire life, I had this little picture of, of myself when I was two years old. I have this little McDonald's T-shirt on, on in my diaper, and I'm carrying this basketball. And so from a young age, man, I just knew that I, I loved sports. I loved to ball. And if it had a ball, I wanted to do it. Um, and I, I remember seeing my mom pulled out a, a letter that I wrote to her in my second grade class. My teacher, uh, for our assignment for Mother's Day, asked us to write a letter to our mom and tell her what we wanted to be when we grew up. And my mom actually pulled the letter out a couple years ago and asked me if I remember writing it. And, and uh, on the letter, basically said, Mom, when I grow up, I want to be a starting pitcher for the Texas Rangers, a starting center for the Dallas Mavericks, and a starting quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. And so since, since uh, early on, Lots I had goals. dreams and goals. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> dreams and goals to be a professional athlete or to do something with sports. And, and then growing up in Texas, it's the, I, I, can't, I couldn't imagine a better place to be able to facilitate that. Just with the resources, with the passion, with the, uh, you know, the intensity. And you know, growing up, and then I moved around a lot. And so there wasn't always a whole lot of consistency there for me. But I was able to find that consistency through sports and through, uh, you know, that dynamic. And so going to school at Petrolia, which was a small 1A school, I mean, it's, I mean, I think the class had maybe 45 kids in it total. Um, And honestly, it was difficult for me uh, early on because it was a small, uh, primary, primarily white uh, city, county, if you will. And right. did, did face some racism, did face some issues with that early on. And, you know, as a young kid, um, you know, who, who didn't really understand that, that dynamic a whole lot. Uh, it was the first time I ever experienced that. First time I had ever, um, you know, come across that. But sports was my outlet to be able to find that piece. And, and it was just amazing to see how a community that was so divided early on when I first stepped in to that community, that, that, that city, uh, the sports kind of brought that together and just through my ability and my play on the field allowed the community to kind of rally together and kind of find mutual ground. And, uh, man, it was a interesting time. 
it definitely developed a lot of character, a lot of uh, passion for the game of football. Um, but man, I, I'm true to my roots and I'm proud to be from Wichita Falls, Texas. I love that. Now, where did your faith walk begin? Did were you, were you a man of faith as a, you know, did you grow up in a faith based home or did that kind of, so something that came to you, you know, later on in life? Yeah. You know, my, and that was something that my parents were very intentional about, uh, from an early age. My mom is, uh, from a Catholic background and my dad grew up in a church of Christ background and, um, you know, so they, their faith and religion was very, very important to them. And, I, and just from an early age, my dad would, uh, you know, he'd read Bible stories, Bible verses to us before we go to bed, and, you know, would take us to church and we're, was very intentional about making sure that we were rooted in a Christian home and Christian biblical principles. Um, and so it wasn't until about eighth grade, I would say, that I really started to find my personal walk, my personal relationship. Uh, I had just moved to a new school and it was the actually the school that I had issues with and um, you know, from just being a mixed kid and in a, in a predominantly white uh, city in a white area and uh, went to the youth group there. And I remember just um, uh, what didn't have a whole lot of money, didn't have a whole lot of resources. Uh, the youth group was going to church camp, Falls Creek, Oklahoma. And I had I'd gone to church my whole life. I had actually um, was baptized as a baby, you know, the, the, the Catholic sure. uh, christening. And, you know, decided to go to youth camp and wanted to go and experience it because I had never experienced something on my own. I'd always gone to church with my dad. I'd always gone to church with my mom. I'd never had an opportunity and I'd never really gone to church or had a, had a purpose for myself. And so this was the first time. But the problem was is that we didn't have the money to do it. We didn't have the resources to do it. And so uh, I remember standing in front of the church, I think a week before we were supposed to leave for, ch for church camp, and uh, my youth pastor was standing in front of the church talking to everybody, telling them about what we were going to do with the youth camp, and uh, basically called me up to the front and said, this is uh, David Nelson. He's a new student here in our congregation, and, uh, but unfortunately doesn't have the money to be able to go to youth camp. And so we're asking our church body and our church congregation to come together, to rally together, to support David so that he can go to youth camp with us. And I, mean, I remember sitting up there just so embarrassed, didn't know anybody. And I'm not one of those people that likes to really ask people for help and wants to show my vulnerability yeah. in that way, even especially in eighth grade. Um, and I remember just looking around and, and nobody got up and nobody walked to the front. Nobody, they had a little offering plate at the front. And, and I was the only one up there with my youth pastor. And man, nobody got up, nobody walked up there. And I just remember just just falling, sinking into my in my shoes, just praying like God, either get me out of here or just have somebody come up here and just give a dollar, just so I don't feel like a complete loser and completely rejected. And I, I remember this little this lady who just had really torn and weathered clothes. Um, you know, I, I had kind of seen her a couple times before previously. She kind of stayed in the back. She didn't really get engaged a lot. She wasn't the the well dressed one. She wasn't the crazy uh, charismatic one, but she was just there. And I remember she walked up and she had this bag, a Ziploc bag, just full of quarters, dimes, pennies, and nickels. It was just changed. And she just walked up and she put the Ziploc bag into the uh, little offering plate and walked over to me and said, you know, this was money that I've been saving for, uh, you know, I was going to take myself out in a nice lunch. I was going to take myself out in the spa day or whatever it may be. Um, and I've been saving it for about six months now. But for some reason, I just felt like uh, I was led and called to give this to you. I don't know what that means, but you know, I'm just praying that this uh, blesses you beyond what it could possibly bless me. And it ended, ended up being about $15 short of what I needed. The youth, my youth pastor ended up going ahead and, and covering the rest of it. But uh, man, it's, it's, it was such a powerful experience for me because I ended up getting saved on that trip. I ended up, uh, David Nasser was a speaker at Falls Creek, and I remember him calling the altar call, and I remember just Man, it was it, uh, at that time I knew without a doubt that it was time for me to give my life to the Lord, um, and not as my, not to the Lord that my dad worships, not to the Lord that my mom worships. If that makes sense, but to a personal commitment, a personal relationship with uh, the with the Savior over my life and what He had done for me. And and honestly, to this day, I haven't seen that lady since. Uh, but it's just such a powerful reminder to me of how much beauty and how powerful it can be when one person responds to the call that God has for you and when they re respond to uh, what he has. I mean, there are so many people in that room that didn't respond, but that one lady did. 
And it wasn't from the most likely of sources. It wasn't from the most wealthy person in the room. It wasn't from the most spiritual person in the room, if you will. But it was just from a, a, a by low class, um, just humble lady that just came up and just basically probably gave me everything she had in her savings because she believed that the Lord was going to do something greater and more <laughs> more powerful than she can ever think or imagine. And, you know, I, I wish to this day that I could find that woman and thank her and tell her that because of her sacrifice, because of her offering that day, thousands of kids uh, through our foundation or whatever it may be have come to know the Lord. And it started with her. And that chain reaction started with that woman's response to the call that God had for her. And man, it's just crazy just to look back and think and it, how it kind of all started and it wouldn't have happened without that woman. Man, that's such a powerful story. And I always think, you know, my daughter is middle school right now. And, you know, she has a faith, but she has the faith that my wife and I have kind of instilled in her since she's been born. But sometime, right. at some point, she's going to have to make that faith her own. And for you, you had to make your faith that own. And you don't know where that's going to come from. You don't know when it's going to come from or from who. And But God's timing is so perfect. And your story is just awesome, man. That's so great Amen. to hear. Amen. And I mean, and, and my parents did for... You know, and that's what it is as parents and as, you know, leadership, you try to put them in position as much as you can to experience that and to inhabit that, that calling or to inhabit that grace. Um, but it is such a powerful feeling and powerful experience to where it's not a external experience. It's not something that you just experience. And then a week later, it just washes off and it's like a flame that just burns out. It's that it's an internal transformation. It's that Philippians, what I once counted as gain and now count as loss for the sake of Christ. And the things that I had just held near and dear to my heart and things I was striving for and uh, pursuing and living for just no longer seemed valid, no longer was important. And it was no denying it because I'm I'm not one of those people that want to walk up during the altar call. I'm I'm more of a behind the scenes kind of guy, and yeah. and so I definitely fought it for the first couple of days there at youth camp. But uh, it just can't got to a point to where you know I've heard people talk about this. I've heard people kind of mention what this is, uh, but it's a whole other element, a whole different dynamic when you can when you experience it for yourself. And man, it's uh, there's a song that I listen to. It's called Back to the Beginning. And it's just anytime I'm having a hard day or anytime I'm having, uh, you know, just difficulty or maybe maybe going through the valleys of life, uh, just going back to the beginning of where that intersection met, that divine intervention of my, when my heart, you know, met his grace for the first time and just reminding myself what that was like and um, when I became new again. Yeah, that's such a powerful story. We're talking to David Nelson here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. David, you have a, obviously a very successful high school football career, and I want to take it to the point when Urban Meyer first walks into, I'm assuming, your house, but I want to hear the story of the moment you, he came to visit you for the first time and, and just your thoughts about Coach Meyer, that very first moment you had with him. Yeah, well, believe it or not, I actually committed to Notre Dame. I was supposed to be a golden domer okay um my my mom grew up i mean growing up watching rudy rudy's my favorite movie and and i had never you know grew up from texas i grew up a huge longhorns fan and so it was pretty much a given that i was going to be a longhorn uh but because the rudy recruiting situation is a little bit difficult and crazier than people think uh end up committing to tyrone willingham over at notre dame and then they let him go they fired him my senior year of high school uh, and that was at the exact same time that Urban was leaving Utah and going to Florida. And so he had recruited me at Utah. And, you know, I, I made sure to let him know that I loved him and I respected him as a coach. But I just wasn't feeling, you know, the Utah <laughs> going to Utah to play football. And <laughs> and so uh, when he took the job. I remember him calling me and asking, you know, because I, I hadn't heard about it yet. I didn't know uh, that he was leaving Utah to go to Florida. And, he called and asked, you know, hey, I know you said you didn't want to come to Utah and you said that, you know, if I was ever if I was at a, another school that you would give me a chance. Well, what about Florida? And so he was calling my bluff a little bit because I didn't want to, you know, full, completely reject the situation. And so <laughs> when he called me, I was actually in the U.S. Army All-American game playing. Uh, and so it was the first time I had talked to him on the phone. And man, I, I, at that time, he was the hottest coach in the country. I mean, he was, you know, doing he would just come off of a undefeated season of Fiesta Bowl at Utah and was now bringing that exciting spread spread option offense to Florida, and 
Uh, you know, honestly, I didn't grow up a Florida fan. I actually grew up watching Miami and Florida State and never really knowing much about the Gators. But, you know, just him as a coach and him as a uh, offensive mind just really intrigued me. And, and so he ended up getting a, re- a recruiting trip from me. And so the first time him and I met in person was when I actually flew to Gainesville. And um, I, I'm not somebody – I'm not very – I'm not a big thinker. I'm not a big logical. I don't really rely on reasoning and logic very often. I usually rely on, on my gut instincts and what I feel uh, in my heart to be true. Um, a mentor of mine always gave me the, the advice to pursue peace. Uh, if you feel peace somewhere, to pursue that and to kind of step deeper into that as opposed to a pros and cons list. I know that works for some people, and it, there, is, um, there is validity there in some way, but for me, uh, I've always found that the best decisions I've ever made, the places that I've always found so much anointing and favor is when I just really truly f- pursue that peace that I feel in my heart. And uh, that weekend we were in Gainesville, my f- mom and my dad, my brother were both were all there. And um, after, the, after the trip was done, just, you know, with the players and with Coach Meyer and the coaches, and I had never been to Gainesville before. I knew about the swamp, but didn't know much about it. And uh, we were only there for two days, and I remember walking into my uh, hotel room. And I looked at my mom and my dad, and I said, this just feels right. And they both looked at me and said, yeah, I agree. We don't necessarily – we're not excited, excited, ecstatic that you were traveling halfway across the country, but if there was a coach and if there was a university that we would feel comfortable and feel at peace about you going that far away from, it's with Coach Meyer and with this place. And so – uh, I asked them if they were okay with me committing on the spot because we kind of talked about beforehand that we weren't going to do that. And so, you know, we kind of prayed about it then and they have both just said, you know what, it's time. We all feel great about it and we feel comfortable with what's going on. And there was just an overwhelming piece that it was, I was supposed to take a couple more trips after that, but we just walked away knowing that what we were looking for and what we wanted out of a college, out of a coach, out of a situation, uh, rested in Gainesville, Florida. And so, Man, we committed right there, and the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Very true. Talking to David Nelson here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. You're at Florida. You win two national titles. You're playing on national TV every week. Everything seems great for you from a sports perspective. You know, Tim Tebow is the star quarterback. You're one of his favorite targets to throw to. What was your time at Florida like, both on the field, which from afar looked like it was awesome, but yeah. even more, what was it like spiritually for you and then off the field for you? Yeah. You know, and I, I wish I could sit here and tell you that after my encounter with the Lord in eighth grade, uh, I was walking the straight and narrow. I was walking the 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 the, the, um, the narrow path. But I, that, unfortunately, that's not the case. And I, I wish that I had spent as much time in preparation for football and preparation for sports as I did in my, my Christian walk and my relationship with the Lord and um, in developing that foundation, I didn't really understand how difficult it would be being out on, in the world by myself for the first time. Um, and I really just kind of kind of stepped into it a little naive and a little, uh, a little innocent to it. And so my first couple of years, because I grew up in a very, very disciplined household, um, you know, my father was very, very structured, very disciplined, be home at 930, no ifs, ands or buts about it. I uh, wasn't really allowed to go to you know, high school dances. Um, and so it was very disciplined. And so stepping out of that into a college university by myself for the first time, uh, making my own decisions, doing my own things. And, uh, you know, honestly, it's uh, I, I fell back into that world, if you will. And I always try to give it as an example of I, I started to find my identity in football. And so I started to pursue the things that were would come from it, like the girls, the fame, the money, the attention, the accolades. And if my if I had a good practice, then my world was great. If I had a bad practice, then my world was crumbling. And I just started to find my my validity, my identity through myself as a football player. And I, that meant I wanted everything with it. And I started just to see myself just drown deeper and deeper into that. And it was crazy because there was a direct correlation to my play on the field. Um, just because I kind of lost that um, – that truth because I had lost that relationship and that firm foundation that I'd had so long that I kind of now put God in the back seat. And I would, I guess I would, I guess I came what I would what I'd call a hobby Christian. 
uh, superstition Christian to where if it was, I'll go to church to get something or to, to pray to the Lord to have a good game on Saturday. And, but then Monday through Thursday, I was living just like the world, uh, wants you to live. And so I was, I was wearing this mask and just for so long, uh, I was doing the Christian walk when I was with Christians and then I was doing the other stuff when I was with the other people. And, um, it just, I just started to become somebody I didn't recognize. And it was my, probably my freshman and sophomore year, uh, which like, like I said, is a direct core. It was a direct correlation to my play on the field because I didn't play it down my mm-hmm. freshman and sophomore year. I came as a five-star recruit, U S army, all American, uh, highly touted and, and kind of, and then came in and I, I had the mentality of, um, you know, it's the coach's fault. It's their fault. I'm not playing. It's right. everybody else's fault. Uh, and just started filling my head and I just became, I just started grumbling. I started complaining. I started to become uh, a, a cancer in the locker room. And, you know, there's that book by uh, C.S. Lewis that talks about, you know, he's talking about the demons and the, how they mentor each other. And the demon was mentoring the other demon. And he said, if you really want to uh, make an impact on the on a church, if you really want to take the church and take the power out of it, then what you got to do is you got to start with one Christian and you got to get him grumbling about another. And it just basically talks about how, that's Satan's number one strategy is to get Christians talking and, and, and demeaning and uh, grumbling and gossiping about one another. And, and I just started to fall victim to that. And I remember just after, I guess, my junior year, my sophomore year, I'm sorry, um, when we lost to Ole Miss. And that was the, the Tim Tebow promise, that you'll never see a player play as hard as I will the rest of the season, team play as hard as we will the rest of the season. And right. And that was the game, I would say, for me to where it really turned around, uh, where everything shifted because uh, up until that point, it was, I was now in, I was at Gainesville, in Gainesville for two and a half years at that point. I had one national championship ring, but didn't really play a whole lot and didn't really contribute. Um, but I walk into the locker room, and I see some of my closest friends like Lewis Murphy and Riley Cooper and, and Tim Tebow and you know, a bunch of these guys who we had worked so hard with, so hard together. And I'd come in, you know, from high school together and I talked about all these things that we wanted to do and to accomplish and be a part of something special. And, and I'm walking in and these guys have blood and grass stains all over their uniforms. And I'm looking at mine and I have nothing. And I just see how upset they were of that loss because the first time we had lost at home since we had uh, been on campus together mm. and just seeing how just dist- how just. Um, dis- destruct. I mean, d- how um, devastated they were, and how upset they were, and how much they had just given their all uh, out there. And I'm looking around, and I did nothing to contribute to that. And I remember just thinking, just I would, I was numb. I would give anything to feel something. I give anything to be that upset, to care about something so much that you just have that you have that feeling of rejection or feeling of of um, uh, of, of a loss. And so I remember when Tim went in and did that whole thing, the next day I walked into Coach Meyer's office and I said, listen, I'm tired of complaining. I'm tired of being a part of the problem. I'm tired of pointing the finger and, and saying that everybody else is to blame for me not being on the field. And I want to take accountability and take it in my own hands and say, listen, Coach, whatever I have to do to help this team and to contribute and to be a blessing and to be uh, an encouragement or support to my, to my teammates, uh, I want to do it. And just the next week is when I went in and I started playing special teams. I played punt return. Uh, I'd never played special teams in my whole life and <laughs> just put the pride and the ego behind because I was a receiver. And I thought the only way you can really do anything is to catch passes. I wanted to go to the NFL and you can't do that by playing on punt block. And, um, you know, I just put the pride and the ego behind and said, listen, coach, whatever the team needs. And it started there. And that's where my career just took off. But, you know, I, I really contribute that to Tim and I would really contribute that to what he uh, represented and what he embodied, not just in what he said to the media and not what people see on TV, but, you know, the person that, you know, I saw him live the same way when he was at 530 in the morning as he was at 12 o'clock at night. You know, he didn't turn it off and there was, he was the exact same. He was consistent. There was consistency in his character and his integrity and his work ethic and his approach to the game of football and also the game of life. And, um, you know, that was something that for me, I had never really had a chance to see that of, of somebody who is my peer living that out. I'd seen my pastors and, and, you know, my youth group leader and people who are older than me. And, you know, you get in that comparison game of, well, they're super Christian and I'm not and I have a ways to go. And and just seeing somebody who was in my same, 
you know, age range, my same demographic, uh, made it real for me, made it realistic and, and, and attainable for me. And, uh, you know, he really saw something in me because like I said, when I first got to campus, I was living, uh, just, I was living out in the shell yeah. of something that I wasn't. And you just, I just didn't recognize myself and, and to give Tim credit. He noticed that, uh, early on and he was always encouraging me, making sure that, you know, he knew that I was not, um, living up, forget about football, just living up as a person, uh, character wise, uh, to the standards that he believed I, I could live up to and was always encouraging and challenging me in that way. And, uh, just finally woke up one day, man. And just, uh, you know, it's friendships like that. It's that iron sharpens iron, um, that I look back at my time at Florida and just consistently, uh, I had those guys a support system like that around me who refused to let me settle and who refused to let me just fall back into the back. That's great. Talking to David Nelson here. It is the Sports Spectrum Podcast. I am Jason Romano. And basically, you kind of talked a little bit about it with regards to Mr. Tebow, but I got to get it out of the way or else people are going to yell at me <laughs> because I am talking to somebody who caught passes from him and was a teammate of his. What is what was he said how he was? You saw an authenticity about Tim Tebow uh, that was the same off the air as he was on or the same on the field as he was off. But what? Yeah. What what is what is it about Tim that is so captivating to not just your general public but the I mean the world like there's just something about him that draws people to him and it's almost like uh, and certainly from non Christians you know there's like this fascination with who he is as a person yeah. I I guess I'll just ask it simply what what is Tim Tebow really like you know and uh, he is the most competitive. <laughs> <laughs> the most uh, strong-willed, some would say stubborn, um, the most genuine, the most caring. Um, but man, he is, uh, he is the, when I think of what a leader looks like and what a leader uh, acts like, uh, he's the first person that comes to mind. Just because I, you know, I do believe a, a leader and somebody who is, uh, you know, has leadership qualities, you know, can say the right things and can rah rah and rally the team with his voice and with his words. Um, but more than anything for Tim, it was just the way he lived. And I, I think the reason why so many people are drawn to him and so many people are just enamored with him is because I, I really believe that he is is kind of breaking the stigma of. What, it, what it's like to be a Christian male, what it's like to be a Christian man. Um, I, I, I think in a lot of ways, society wants to see a Christian and think that they got to be very, uh, you know, soft and, and nurturing and tender and loving. And those are all different qualities and characteristics of a Christian. But Tim comes out and he's fierce and he's intense and he's, you know, you know he's, he's flexing on the field. He's running guys over and there's no... Uh, apology about it. And he's just got this, uh, you know, this warrior, if you will, instinct and warrior characteristic and capability about him. And, you know, that's when you look at scripture, those are the heroes of scripture. Those are the people that, you know, <laughs> Jesus came in and says, I came uh, not, not with a, not for peace, but with a sword. Yes. And it just talk, just goes through all these different dynamics of, you know, Jesus was a bad dude. And he came in and was really, really ready to, you know, they call it uncommon fellowship. It was breaking rules and breaking the status quo and, and was stepping out in places that others wouldn't go and was unafraid, but also at the same time was going with, score with it with peace and love. And, and I think the reason why Tim is just so appealing is that he's breaking that stigma and you see him and he, you can be a, a warrior and, and intense and competitive, but what he does and his way of living, it transcends football. You're seeing it the way he works out. You're seeing it the way he, he studies. You're seeing it the way he uh, cares for his brothers and sisters and mom and dad and, and the least of these with his foundation. You're seeing it in his approach and his speaking. You're seeing it in his play. It's not just something, and he loves the verse, and it's become my verse, which is Colossians 3.23 that says, with it, whatever you do, do it with all of your heart as if you're serving the Lord, not human masters. And he really embodies that because if, I mean, if the guy is going to go and he's going to 
do laundry, he's going to do laundry at 110%. And there's nobody going to, nobody's going to outwork him when it comes to doing laundry. And he really, really believes in that. Well, we're seeing so that now, like, David, too, with him playing baseball, like Tim Tebow playing baseball. You're just watching this, like, what is happening? <laughs> and then he has his first home run or first at bat and he hits a home run. So you're just seeing this guy who he's not just kind of doing this as a side hustle or a hobby. Like you're seeing, and maybe you've talked to him about it, but you're seeing a man who really is truly putting all his all into trying to become a professional baseball player. Is that surprising to you? Not at all. Not at all. And that's where, you know, it talks about, if, you know, I run this race with endurance and I run this run, run this race to a crown of righteousness and that we are in this life journey uh, to run a marathon. And that's what I, I, I love about him and that I got the chance to witness it firsthand is is that. He may not in what society considers be successful. He may not go out there and achieve the American dream. And I love, I think he even had an interview um, with uh, uh, Stephen A. Uh, with uh, First Stephen Take, a, Smith and First Take. A couple of weeks ago and just talked about how his American dream is different than what people try to put on him to be the American dream. Yeah. And I mean, he, he, I mean it's, it's in true Tim fashion to where it's kind of one of those things where you hear about it. It's like, okay. He hit his first at bat, hits a home run. Of course he did, in true Tim Tebow fashion. <laughs> but it's there's no it's it's one of those things for people who know it. It's not a coincidence. It's not something that you just say, oh my gosh, how does he just happen to do these things? How does he just happen to be in the right place at the right time? Because we look at it and say, okay, well it's only well it's the home run or it's the fourth quarter, it's Tebow time. But if you look at, I mean, the Delta Airlines flight a few months ago when somebody had a seizure and he walked up and put his hands on him and just started praying for him. And so it's not just in the, the things that we see in the, in the gridiron and in the baseball field. It's also just in an everyday life when things or situations come up, he's, re, he's responding rather than reacting because he comes from a strong place of, of foundation because he's so rooted in his in his discipline with the gospel. He's so rooted in prayer, so rooted in community that whenever things come up, it's not shaking him and he's not reacting. He's really responding. Love that. Talking to David Nelson here. David, let's go to the 2010 NFL draft. Your your college career is over. You just mentioned Tebow. Uh, all eyes were on the quarterbacks that year. Sam Bradford, Colt McCoy, Tebow. But you had to wait. In fact, you didn't get drafted. What what was that time like for you when you're thinking, okay, maybe I'm going to make this next step and go to the NFL, and then you don't get drafted? Yeah, you know, and it was uh, because, like I said, I had I had wasted so much time early on um, that I had a lot to make up for in, in the last, I guess, year and a half of my college career, and so the the longevity of a career wasn't there. The st- the stats that that uh, NFL coaches and scouts are looking for wasn't there, uh, the rap sheet and the history. So I had to make up for it, and I understood that. And I and I had gotten to a point to where I knew that it was – I had nobody to blame but myself. And I had nobody to uh, look back and say, okay, well, I, if I don't make it or if it doesn't happen, it really was on me. But also at the same time, I did have the opportunity. And so it wasn't a very large opportunity. It was a little small uh, – small. the door was open just a small bit. Um, but I, I was going to explore it and give it all that I had. And so I didn't know for sure if it was going to work out, but I, I trained my tail off and I did everything I could and put myself in position to be drafted, went from not even on coaches, uh, radar to, uh, at the end of, you know, pro day, uh, being on a few coaches talking about maybe getting drafted. And so, man, that was a crazy, cause now it's spread out into three days. And right. so they got the first round and they got the second and third round and they got third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round. And, you know, it's it, it was an interesting dynamic because a bunch of my close friends were being drafted like Timmy had gotten taken in the first round. And some of these guys who I had just gotten to know or my, or my best friends were just experiencing just this uh, dream come true. And I was texting them, letting them know how happy I was for them. And man, the third day came around and it was a fifth, sixth, seventh uh, round day and I had a couple of coaches start calling in the sixth round and say, hey, you know, we're trying if we if the coaches, you know, if we don't get the guy who we want here or if you're still available here, we're going to take you. And, it, and the phone started ringing a little bit. And so it started to get a little excitement, it started to get a little um, <laughs> a little adrenaline going. And I, I remember just watching ESPN, the ticker every time it would do that. Doo, 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 doo. Yes, I would look up and I was w- waiting to see if my name was going to come across because, <laughs> you know, somebody, almost every team at one point in the sixth round had called and said, you know, we're thinking about taking you if, you know, if it works out, we'd love to be able to take you here. And 
Um, I just, man, I just, every second that was ticking by, I was just watching it and just was so nervous and, you know, it didn't happen. It didn't work out. Um, but I remember just talking to my family about it before and that, you know, if we got past the fifth round, which was probably likely that we didn't get picked up in the first five, that we would prefer to go undrafted so that I would be able to choose the team that I would be able to, you know, go on Right. so that I knew the depth chart, I knew the situation, I knew what I was stepping into as opposed to being drafted by a team that, you know, wasn't a good situation for me. And so, man, it's crazy. I don't know how, how familiar people are with the undrafted process, but literally as Chris Berman is talking about Mr. Irrelevant and they're doing the whole Mr. Irrelevant thing, as soon as that's done, the coaches are on the phone calling undrafted free agents and talking to them and, and negotiating and, you know, the Cowboys called and offered me this much and then the Patriots called and it's Bill Belichick and it's he's like, hey, we, I guarantee you, I promise you at least a practice squad spot mm. if you come and sign with us. Then you got this other team who's offering you a lot of money for undrafted, but it's not a great situation. And and so it was just crazy how as soon as it was over and you're you're just, I was disappointed and I felt like it was you know an opportunity to pass me by, but almost immediately it wasn't time to really kind of sit and and sulk. It wasn't time to really feel sorry for myself. It was get into, okay, now I'm fielding calls. And so now I'm the one being pursued by head coaches and GMs. And it, so it's a kind of crazy dynamic and crazy transition. But did you have an agent Were you, were you, was your agent fielding the calls? Were you doing it? Like, what was that process like? Are you sitting with your agent? How was that like? I did have an agent. We weren't together. Um, we weren't in the same area cause you know, he had a few other guys too that he had. Um, and because it's so crazy, it's, both they're calling me they're calling him i remember at one point bill belichick had called me and like i said he had promised or guaranteed at least a practice squad spot because he really liked my development really liked where i was and he had just drafted a few of my other players and really wanted to kind of get a couple more um and i remember he was telling me <laughs> it's kind of funny uh he was telling me all of this and so he had asked me at the end of it you know are you interested and so i took the way he asked the question as this, as if he was asking me if i was interested so i said yes I guess that he thought that he was saying, so do we have a deal? And so when I said yes, he thought it was a done deal. So he's, okay, well, we're going to hang up. I'm going to call your agent, get all the details figured out, make sure that you know we have it all ironed out. And so he hangs out with me, calls my agent. I'm talking on the phone with Chan Gailey now at this point from the Bills. Um, <laughs> I hang up with the Bills. I call my agent, and he's like, so did you just – did you just commit with the Patriots? Are you, what's going on there? I thought we were, you know, I really thought the Buffalo thing was going to be a good situation. And, and so I was a little confused and didn't know what had to just happen. And so I ended up having to call New England back and apologizing and making sure that they, I misunderstood it and misinterpreted it. And, and so I think to this day, coach Belichick still holds that against me. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to he's upset made, Bill Belichick. Right? He's made sure to make my life uh, pretty difficult when we go and play the Patriots. But, um, but yeah, it was uh, we both. So he was both. He was dealing more with like the the contract, more with the the money and the amount of you know whatever guaranteed money they're going to give. And I was dealing more with you know the coaches and receiver coaches and, and what they thought would be a good fit for me and what they were trying to recruit me into. Gotcha. So you get picked up by Buffalo. You just mentioned the Bills and Chan Gale. You play three seasons with them. What was that time like in in Buffalo? Just getting acclimated to being an NFL player. I could not imagine starting my career anywhere else. And I say that because when I signed with Buffalo, the next thing that I, that I did was I hung up and started kind of took a deep breath and kind of celebrated with my family really quickly. And then I looked around and I was like, Oh no, <laughs> Buffalo. <laughs> You're a Texas boy. boy. <laughs> I'm a Texas boy who played in the Southeastern conference. So the coldest I've ever played is probably 65 degrees. Yeah. So, and then just, Buffalo. I mean, I grew up a Cowboys fan, man. I grew up in the '90s here in Dallas with the Cowboys going, winning three Super Bowls, and two of them were against the Buffalo Bills. And so I just grew up knowing. I didn't know much about Buffalo, but that they had really good chicken wings, that Niagara Falls was close, and that they had lost four straight consecutive Super Bowls. That was just unheard of. And so it kind of sunk in immediately. But man, just the people there. Uh, the culture there, the community there, it's a small town. There's nothing to do but hang out with your teammates and hang out with the community. Um, and it really just forced me to focus on ball, forced me to focus on what I was there to do. There wasn't any distractions. There wasn't any crazy 
uh, marketing and TV gigs and, and uh, appearances because it's Buffalo. Right. But it, it just it really forced us to really hang out with each other, but also for, forced us to focus on ball. And man, I, I loved my time there. It was something that you know when I stepped in. Uh, I was going to do everything I possibly could that was in my control. And I based every morning I woke up and you know whatever is in your control take care of, handle your business. And so if I was, if meetings were at 745, I was going to be there at 730. I was not going to let something like that keep me from being on the team to where it's something I can control being on time or knowing my plays or whatever it may be. At the end of the day, I, if I didn't make the team and I did everything that was in my control and I didn't make the team, I could rest my head in the pillow and say, I gave it all that I had. I gave it all that I could. Uh, and it did, just didn't work out. But luckily, it was a great situation. Um, Chan, when he called me, Coach Gailey called me, and he said, listen, I'm not going to promise you anything. I know a lot of these coaches are promising you certain things and are, are promising you a lot of money. Um, but I'm going to tell you one thing. I'm not going to promise you, but I, I will give you the opportunity to compete. And I basically said that's all I could ask for, and that's all I was really wanting, looking for. And, and, and he was a man of his word, and, um, and it was a great group of guys. We didn't win a whole lot, but I couldn't imagine starting my career – uh, in the NFL because it was just it was blue collar. I mean, it's not fancy. It's, the stadium's not fancy. Our uniforms weren't fancy. Our facilities weren't fancy, but it was just football. And you had a bunch of just people in the community that just loved the team, whether they won or lost, and they knew football and they understood it. And it was, it just uh, it showed me what the NFL experience, what a true NFL experience without the TV and all the big media is all about. Buffalo is. It's it's home to me. Yeah, and those Bills fans, they're overdue for a for a a long playoff run. Let's just say that. That's that's putting it lightly. <laughs> yes. So we're talking to David Nelson, former NFL wide receiver. And I, David, I want to switch gears a little bit, going from your NFL career. I want to go to 2012, and an opportunity for you to go to Haiti happens. Volunteering, I believe it was after the earthquake, and, and mm. something happens when you go to Haiti that first time. Can you tell? Tell me about that trip and how that really just changed your life. Yeah, you know, and we, we, we talked briefly just about, you know, how I guess my personal spiritual journey kind of started. And I guess that I would call that point A. And, you know, as a Christian, you're always wanting to go deeper and continue to grow spiritually, you know, emotionally. And, and I had gotten to a place of, um, I don't want to say a relentless rut, but it was just a constant... Uh, consistency, and I was just looking for something to challenge myself, mm. looking for something to, um, I don't want to say test myself, but just understand where I was at and see things from a different perspective. Um, I'd heard, you know, a lot of, I've heard about people going on mission trips. I've, I've heard a lot of uh, different things like that. And I just never had the opportunity to. And, and so after my second year in the NFL, and, you know, a big part of the reason why I wanted to play professional sports as a, as a kid is because I wanted to help people. I love kids. I love uh, serving. I love, I love helping people and, and just being around uh, that dynamic. And, and so I, I, after my second year, had really um, solidified myself, if you will, had a really good season, was, was in a good place to where I felt like I could now step out and pursue things outside of football and not just focus on football. And, and the opportunity came up to go to Haiti and and it was a great opportunity, and it was just something kind of presented itself. It's not something that I went out and looked for. It wasn't something I was researching. Like I said, it just felt right, and it was just a four-day trip, and um, went there over Memorial Weekend, and it was the first time that I'd ever experienced anything like that. And I say like I say, stretching my faith in a way that how do you love someone, and how do you show someone the gospel, and how do you go and make disciples in many nations when you can't speak to them, when there's a language barrier? communication barrier. So how do you really be the hands and feet of Jesus without being able to talk to him and communicate and say the right things? And it just opened up a new di new dynamic and it just shifted paradigms in my life of, of just appreciation, perspective. Um, and specifically, um, you know, I, I was hanging out with orphan children and I'm the oldest of eight kids. My family is very important to me. Uh, you know, I come from a very, you know, a very solid sound family. Um, and so just being around these kids and here I was as an NFL athlete and being around these kids who had nothing and had, you know, nothing to call their own. But when I asked them what it was that they wanted more than anything in the world, and I thought it was gonna be food or water or, you know, a place to sleep. 
uh, almost every time their response was my brother, you know, my sister, I want my mom or my dad. And it really just brought things to a, to a perspective of, of what true meaning and what true, um, <laughs> what life is really all about. And it just, it, I can sit here and honestly say that my life and my spiritual walk, um, was transformed by a five-year-old orphan child mm. by just showing me what true love is by showing me what uh, really matters. And so, you know, man, when I come back, I talk about what was I once counted as gain, I now count as lost. It was just a whole different dynamic to where, you know, I, I didn't come back and want to sell my cars and sell everything that I had, but it, it just, it really inspired me and motivated me to, to go deeper and to go into places like that to, man, it, they can teach us so much. And, and we, I would go over there and think we're going to change the world. We're going to uh, change their lives. And, and in reality, of the hundreds of people that I've taken to Haiti and different places like that, it's just consistent that, um, you know, it, there's just this, this true authentic worship, true authentic dependency for, for the Lord. Because in that situation, they have no food, no water, no shelter, but they're still on their knees praying and thanking God for what they do have. And it just humbles you and just shows you a, a, an appreciation for, for the blessings that, life, that the Lord has given you. Um, and it just awakens you and, and shows you a new dynamic of what, uh, what this life could be like for you. And David, it's one thing to be a hearer of the word. It's another, another thing to be a doer. And you have that experience of going to Haiti and suddenly you're a ministry is birthed out of it. And it's not just a ministry. You actually rent a house in Port-au-Prince in Haiti and you bring in a bunch of kids and you saw conditions that I can't imagine uh, are like. I Probably conditions I've never seen in my life. And there's a lot to unpack there, but just let's talk about the, the ministry and how that sort of started and what led you. Because you said you were transformed when you came yeah. back. It's one thing to be transformed and kind of have your faith challenged that's your own, but it's another thing to actually do something about it. You're exactly right. And I, I think that's the that's that's where a lot of people get stuck. And I think that's where a lot of the difficulty and a lot of the frustration um, comes is that when people go and experience something like that, it's that, well, now what? Okay, well, what can I do about it? What can I really, how much can I really help? What can I really do to change things? And, and honestly, when I came back, you know, it did change things and it did trans, transform my life and, and it captivated my heart. And I knew I wanted to do something with orphan children at that point. But at that time, I thought I was just going to use my platform and just say, OK, well, I'll find a couple of organizations I support and just attach my name and help and do whatever I can right. while I'm still playing football. And, and I, I thought that was going to be the case. And, and uh, I wish, <laughs> I wish I could say that's what I, that's not what I wanted, but it was what I wanted because I wanted to be able to still play football and focus on ball while still doing that on the side. And, and God had other plans for me and, um, you know, and for my brothers as well, cause we started it together. And, uh, it was just one of those things to where I had stepped out of my comfort and in, into an uncomfortable place and stretched my faith and found, uh, found a, an anointing and found a calling and purpose over my life that I never knew I had because I stepped out of my comfort, because I was willing to stretch myself and, 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 and step into a place that, um, well, God, I don't know what you're going to do, but I trust that you're going to do and I'm going to meet you there. And, and I, when I came back, it was just just consistently just divine intervention after divine intervention. And it became clear just through a, just through a series of, of uh, man, unquestionable coincidences call it if you will um and i just decided that well you know he called me to go into step a deep step deeper into what he had for me and i came back wanting to just end it there all right i did the mission trip i did it i'm good um and it just was that kind of that moses experience where he goes to the burning bush and he's calling him and saying okay moses this is what i have for you and then moses is like well god i'm speak short of, of slow of tongue and god says well i'll use your brother aaron uh, it was very similar in that situation to where, you know, I didn't, God, I've never done anything like this. I've never, I'm tw- at the time I was 27, 26 years old. I wasn't married. I didn't have any experience running a nonprofit and had only been to Haiti once or twice. Like who, I'm an athlete, you know, people know that we're not the smartest people in the world. So who <laughs> am I to start a nonprofit? Like nobody's going to take me seriously. Nobody's going to really think that I can do this because God, my past 
is not pretty. Everything, you know, people who know the things that I've done, they're going to know that I'm not capable of this. And they're not, nobody's going to follow me. Nobody's going to listen to me. And I just remember just saying all these different reasons why I shouldn't. You don't feel and qualified. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't feel like I, I'm not, I'm not Tim Tebow. Okay. Well, I'll wait till I get to another contract. Then I'll be able to do it. Wait till I have a bigger name. Then I'll be able to do it. And I was starting to barter, and and and, and I called, uh, you know, it's that Hosanna song, um, you know, break my heart for what breaks yours, um, you know, show me the things that break your heart, God. And I remember just praying that, and and it was just that reality that okay, I showed you what breaks my heart, so now what are you going to do about it? And it just became clear that, that okay, well, he's calling me to a deeper d- deeper dynamic and a deeper understanding because at that time, you know, not a whole lot of players in my position were willing to start a foundation and and run it like I did, and and I didn't want to because I thought it was going to take away from a lot of the things I'd worked so hard for my entire life. I was in the prime of my career, so why now? <laughs> why why can't I do it after? Why do I do, why can't I do it later? I'm, let me go and establish myself and let people know what this is and then go do it. And I remember just saying, okay, you know what? I, I trust you. I, I trust that this is for you and this is to glorify you. And and I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if I'm going to tank or people are going to laugh at me, but I'm tired of trying to control it. I'm tired of trying to pretend like I know what's best for me and, and I know the will of my life. And, and it was just the first time I can honestly say that uh, – I stepped into something that I felt was his purpose over my life with no plan B, with no uh, backup plan. It was truly just complete faith and said, okay, God, I'm jumping as if I'm jumping into the water with no life jacket, nothing. I'm jumping in and I'm trusting that you'll catch me. And boy, did he. (laughs) That sounds like he did. We're talking to David Nelson on the Sports Spectrum podcast. A couple more minutes with David. I want to ask you how hard it was for you to play in the NFL, to go back and do what you've been training your whole life to do, be a professional football player, but then also to try and be all in with the ministry and with the children and the orphans in Haiti. How, How difficult was that? It was it was extremely hard. It was extremely difficult because I was trying to balance a few different baskets. Um, I knew that I knew the perception that would be had if people see me that so involved and doing all this and and how it would be perceived as I'm distracted, I'm not focused, I'm not uh, you know I'm not putting as much time and effort into it as, as much as I used to. Uh, also from my from my teammates and in the locker room, uh, I didn't want them to think that I was you know not there. I wasn't giving my all. I wasn't, you know, my mind and my body and my heart wasn't into it. That I was really somewhere else. Same thing for my coaches. And, and so there was a, that, that dynamic, but the hardest part for me, honestly, was early on when I first started going back and forth to Haiti was going to Haiti and seeing the lifestyle there and seeing just, you know, like I said, they have nothing, but yet they have so much joy and peace and, and they're just so appreciative for things. And then coming back into the locker room and just seeing some you know, financial situations that, uh, you know, were just crazy to think about, man, if I could just have half of what you guys are using for that and I can do so much with it here in Haiti. And, and it was just so hard for me because it was that and they just don't understand, you know, how, what, what I'm, what's going on over there and, and how do I go from that and then step into the locker room and be able to have a conversation and, and be a part of conversations that are just so, uh, you know, worldly, and it was just so hard to be able to find that, find that balance to where how I can fit in. And the guys didn't feel like, oh, well, there's the missionary guy again. Oh, here's the, here's the super Christian guy. We can't talk about this stuff with him because you know he's thinks he's too good because he goes and loves orphans in other countries. And you know, I, I really wanted to be in a place where these guys really understood my heart and that I wasn't walking in there thinking I was better than anybody or that I was trying to pressure anyone. Right. Uh, I just truly walk in as the same person that they knew me as. And, and so it was hard to be able to step into it and be able to just to be present and to be loving and to be, um, you know, a body of Christ in the locker room whenever I just seen so much beauty in the midst of so much chaos in Haiti. And then the next day stepping into a locker room and seeing guys, you know, the conversations that were being had and just, it was difficult to be able to maintain that uh, relationship and maintain that 
uh, desire to step in and, and, and be a disciple in that atmosphere. You were out of the game 2015 for the most part. 2016, you didn't play. Do you miss playing football? With all of my heart. Yeah. With all of my heart. Um, you know, and I say that football, I got to a point to where football was no longer my identity, but it was regardless and call it whatever you want to, it was a big part of my life. It was what I had been, I've been doing for, since I was four years old, something I'd worked for. And then, then you talk about, I mean, it was the pinnacle of my profession. I mean, I was, there's 32 NFL teams. There's two starting wide receivers. So that's, there's 64 men in the entire world who could do what I did. And there's just something about that that's, that's just powerful. Yeah. And it was very, very um, inspiring to me. And just the relationships that you have and, and the, the, the brotherhood that you have in there and the, comp- the competitiveness. And, and I wish I could sit here and say, oh, I'm transitioning into the next season. And you know, God's called me out of that season of my life and into the next one. And, um, and it would be, it's beautiful. And I'm excited for what's next. And, and I'm, I'm hopeful for where he's leading me. But also at the same time, somebody's kind of given it the example of kind of mourning, mourning a close friend or mourning something that was so near and dear to you yeah. um, and just calling it what it is and not trying to put it behind you and move on. It's just it's really mourning it. It's, it's understanding it. It's it's reflecting on it. It's uh, looking into it and seeing so many beautiful things that happened in it and seeing what the Lord did in so many powerful ways. Um but at the same time, it, I, I do miss it. It's hard to watch the game, hard to watch Sundays now, um, especially when I really believe I can still do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not like you're an old man. You're only 30 years old. so Yeah. I just wish I could have went out on my terms, not with an injury and not the way it kind of happened. I wish I could just go out one more game and just suit up and go and just play and just give it out and know that that's my last game as opposed to the injury that happened and it was just kind of just a freak deal that just ended it. Now, I understand you're getting married. So personally, things seem to be going on an uptick here, huh? Yeah, 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 man. I mean, I'm 30, uh, living in the heart of Dallas. And so I think the average age for marriage here in Dallas is probably like 23. And so I'm uh, I'm trying to... to you're ancient, I'm, man. You're ancient. On the other end of the spectrum there. <laughs> but we actually we actually met in Haiti about a little over a year ago. Um, and we just met in a... And there's something powerful about, you know, seeing somebody with that in outside of their element as well. Uh, just and I saw her just loving on kids and, you know, no makeup, no, um, you know, awareness of what she's looking like it was just she was just really there for the kids and and i got to see her serve i got to see her love Uh, i got to see her outside of her element and how she responds and and lives in that way and uh, we just really drew 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 close together in that space and and we get married in june and i cannot wait (laughs) i'm excited for you man i'm excited for you now we're going to wind down here a couple things that i really just want to ask you about the I'm me foundation. It's how could be, if people want to be a part of it, if people want to, uh, you know, they're inspired by what you hear. Uh, they might felt called that maybe they've been to Haiti before. Maybe they've never been to Haiti before and want to, um, explore that. What's the best way to, to, what would encourage me, I guess, would you provide for them in the best way that they can kind of get involved through the foundation? Yeah. Well, I, I would say the first thing I would encourage people, whether they've been to Haiti or not, or to, you know, a mission trip like that or not is, to come to Haiti because you can't explain it. You can't describe it. I can't even try to remotely describe to you how beautiful and how powerful and how majestic it is. So just come and see. And that's what we're doing, man. We're, we're trying to welcome people into that place because, you know, we've done it a little differently. We actually call it a vision trip. We don't call it a mission trip. We call it a vision trip because we want you to go into serve and be served, to love and be loved. You know, a lot of times we think of the word mission well, the word mission by the sense of the word is beginning and end. It has goals and objectives and things. And so you hear about specifically in the military terms, it's mission accomplished or mission failed. And so we want people to understand that when you go on these trips, it doesn't end. It doesn't start when you land in Port-au-Prince and then leave when you land back in your airport. It's just beginning. Um, you know, so we want to be able to – people ask me all the time, well, what are you doing for America? You know, I get that all the time. Of, mm-hmm. Well, there's orphans in, in America. There's – Social issues in America. Well, what are you doing for America? And my response is, come to Haiti and I'll show you. Because we're seeing people come to Haiti on a short 
short trip for four or five days and then they're coming back and they're setting their community on fire. Mm. They're coming back and they're getting involved with their local uh, foster care you know, system. They're getting involved with their local homeless. They go into Haiti and it may not be with our organization or with you know, orphans, but they come back and they're ignited to go deeper with what the Lord has for them. And they get to see the gospel illuminated, maybe for the first time, what it really means to be a disciple into many nations. And so we don't just ask people once they leave to get involved with us. We truly want to lead them and direct them into whatever it is that God is calling them to do. And so that would be the first thing is come to Haiti with us. We'd love to you know, host you, love to uh, serve with you and love with you. Um, and obviously, other than that, you know, obviously our website, imme.org, uh, they can get involved there. You can sponsor one of our kids. They can sponsor one of the 13 kids that we have that we care for, um, or they can run do a fa- do a fundraiser by themselves or buy some of our cool little products that we have on there as well. I love it. That's awesome. I love the work you're doing, David. My my final question for you, when I ask this to all the guests that are on the podcast, is what exactly are you learning, or I guess what specifically are you learning, or what is God teaching you right now? Oh, wow. Without a doubt, it's uh, to be content in all things. Uh, it's, you know, and, and Paul, when he writes from prison and he's, uh, I believe it's the, uh, the Philippians, and he's talking about, I have, I have learned how to be content in all things. And, it's, and for me, it's, okay, well, it's easy for me to be happy and to be in, in, enamored and in wonder of the Lord whenever things are going great. And I'm seeing all these blessings. I'm seeing all this fruit come just supernaturally, if you will. And, and it's easy to be content in that space. But I have a tendency whenever things aren't necessarily happening the way I would like for them to or things are slow or, you know, it's that uh, dry season or valley season that I tend to not be as content as I'd like to be. And so specifically right now, because I'm not working full time right now and I'm not actually actively doing something that I can feel, you know, per- I can feel like I'm not living uh, with purpose. I can feel like I'm not uh, satisfied. And it's just right now, man, just trying to live with the contentment that Paul had. I mean, my man's sitting in jail <laughs> and sitting there saying that, listen, I know you guys are doing your thing and you're having a great time, but I am content because I've seen what it's like to be content. And all I need is the the true, the spirit of the Lord. And so, I'm learning. I wish I could say that I figured it out. It's an ongoing daily process. Let's just say that. <laughs> no, that's awesome, man. Well, listen, uh, he's at Twitter, David Nelson 86. He can reach David on Twitter. Hit him up. Let him know uh, if you're interested in any of this. Also, I am me dot org. I am M E dot org. Check out the website. Learn more about David and the ministry his brother Patrick's running now and the nonprofit. It's just a great great ministry and just looking out to, to, to serve and to love and to be the example that Jesus called us to be. David, this has been great, man. Thanks so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. And, and you know, best wishes to you, man. Man, my pleasure. And thank you for what you do, man. I'm so inspired by you and your story. It's been awesome to follow. And it's just uh, it's a blessing for me to be a part of. So thank you for allowing me to serve. Thanks, man. That was David Nelson, the former, who still wants to play, but former NFL wide receiver. And he championship winner in college at Florida, Tim Tebow's former target at the University of Florida with the Gators. And we bring in Raymond St. Martin. He is the director of digital and media with Sports Spectrum and, of course, with the increase in pro athletes outreach. Raymond, but we, we touched a lot of things there. It was in-depth, and I really liked it. There's nothing you can cut out of that. I feel like he was open. He was honest. I think your interview was great. I, I really, what, what hit me in this, and this is just weird, Jason, how when I do my reading in the morning and then I listen to the podcast and then we, we get together for this, sec- this, this session, how my reading ties into what the interview subject says mm. is just, it's amazing. Like when he told the story, when David told the story of being in eighth grade and standing in front and he's seeking into his shoes and nobody's coming forward, I feel like there was a huge tension point right there. Like there he is at youth group. You know, he could have gone either way. A very a super embarrassing moment that makes him never return or a life-changing moment. Yep. And when this woman in tattered clothes walks up with a bag full of change that, that, that she'd been saving up, listen to what I just read this morning. This is what I read this morning. As he looked up, Jesus saw the rich 
putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. That's amazing to me. That's mm. six months of this woman's savings she had in the bag yep. to go take care of herself, and she gave it. She gave it to David. He goes to camp. He, he gets saved. The seeds of Jesus are, begin to grow in the soil of his heart. You flash forward to 2012, and there he is in Haiti, and that what's been growing in his heart breaks for others that maybe remind him of himself when he needed something so that he could connect to the Lord. And I'm just, man, I just, I just praise God right now that, that there are people in this world that listen and that give from that calling, because that's how we make impact is when we listen and we give and we don't hold back. And the amazing thing is he doesn't know if that woman who gave that bag of change to him to help get him to, uh, you know, eventually coming to Christ has no idea if that woman ever even knows. And she might. She might have seen David Nelson catching touchdowns on a Saturday afternoon all of a sudden from Tim Tebow and they're winning the national championship. She's like, I remember that David Nelson. But she might ha not ha not know. But that's not for you or me or her to ever really need to know about, right? I mean, that's that's the reward that is greater than that is when we're all rejoicing in eternity someday with our <laughs> Lord. That's the reward. And I think that's a great reminder of from David about his story. And um, I just loved his heart. I really did. How do we do that? I mean, you know, you, Jason, myself, people that are listening to this podcast, do we hold back when God calls us for something? And are we afraid of our finances? Are we afraid that if we give what we've saved to six months for six months to something that it will not come back? Yes. Yeah. I, I think that's a big challenge for all of us that I got out of that. And, and how do we hold those things in our heart that when we are exposed to something and it breaks, that we can react in love? Yeah. I think that the fear is a real, real thing. It's actually, it's funny you mentioned that, Raymond, because I'm going to be speaking at my church sometime later this summer, and I've already been thinking about what I wanted to talk about. And the first thing I wrote about yesterday in church was fear, just that mm -hmm. word. And I think fear is real especially when it comes to our finances. It's very real. Giving away all you have, or at least giving away a large portion of what you have, scares a lot of people because they, obviously, it's what they have. You saved up all your life for this money. You did this, you did that, and all of a sudden, I'm giving it away. But God is very clear. Jesus is very clear. And I can speak from my own experience, and I'm sure you can too, that when we do give, when we have that heart to serve and love others and give what we can, and even above that, give what we are supposed to give, not just what we can. God blesses that. He really, truly does. I saw that in my walk about when I was trying to learn what the word tithing meant when I first became a believer, and tithing 10% was mind-boggling to me. I said, no way am I going to give 10% of my money. Then I started reading the Bible. I started talking to people who've been tithing for years, and they all had amazing things to say about the blessings that came back to them. Now, listen, I am not a prosperity gospel guy. I don't believe you give 10, you get 100 back. You give five, you get 10 back. I don't believe that. But I do believe God does say in his word that he will abundantly bless you when you give. Don't know what that means. Doesn't mean he's going to give you back money per se, but you will be blessed. And again, very difficult for a lot of people, including myself, to, to live out. But if God's word says it, then to me, that's the truth. Yeah, it doesn't mean that the lady who gave her her bag of coins is going to walk out of church and meet a, a pedicurist and exactly. a manicurist who's going to come in and do her feet and her nails for her because she gave. Her, her blessing, in my mind, is going to come when she sits before God in the end and she sees all these people that David has impacted because of what she gave that day. Yep. How... Let's, just, let's weigh those on the scales of life, Jason, really quick. Oh, let's yeah. See. No, you're Manny right. Manny Petty, 
uh, <laughs> salvation for 10, 20, 100 other people that David has now impacted as well as his own salvation. Like, and it all goes back to that one lady. It does. That's the it beautiful does. thing. It's like this pay it forward model, this sort of little thing this that just develops into this gigantic thing, all from one simple act of obedience. Yeah, so that, that was what I got from the podcast. And there was so much there. There was, we could go into everything. But I just, I feel like that's what God was speaking to me as I was listening to that. It was making me reflect on my own life and people in my life who've done things for me and just giving me a harder appreciation for those people. Yeah. In, in a huge way. Yeah. David was awesome. And, you know, I think a lot of people, as we think about now, this heart of how we can help and how we can serve, you know, here at Sports Spectrum, we've talked about this. We have an easy way that you can partner with us. It's very simple, and it's actually not a lot of money when you think about it. It's $36 for one year. $36 for a year. That's $3 basically a month. What do you pay for a coffee every day? 2 to $3 a day. We're talking about a month in over a year. It's $36 that you can be a part of what we're doing with Sports Spectrum to get this podcast going. Um, and honestly, we want to bless you back. We want to give you something back. And our way of doing that is to give you the magazine, the Sports Spectrum magazine. We put it out uh, quarterly. Uh, the new issue is coming out at the end of June. We're super excited about that. We're working on it now. And simply go to sportspectrum.com and there's an area there where you can subscribe and be a part of what we're doing here, not just with the podcast, but really a global initiative, Raymond, if you will, of trying to reach the nations for, for Jesus through the power of sports. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Have a great rest of your week, and we will see you next time.